You're listening to the Pilot Boys podcast. V, uh, we're going to jump right into this, man. I, I, um, wow, this has been a crazy week. Um, obviously, with the death of Kobe Bryant on uh, a helicopter crash and his daughter Gianna, and obviously, the, I think there's seven other people who are on the helicopter. It's there's so many layers to this to this story, right? Uh, the pain is real. Um, and I think that you don't necessarily have to be a basketball fan to appreciate uh, Kobe Bryant and his story. Uh, the more that you know, people talk about him, the more you see the impact that he had, not just on the court and not just with his teammates, but just in day to day life with, you know, reporters and journalists and random people on the street. I mean, it seems like everybody kind of has a story. Mm -hmm. about Kobe and and how he impacted their lives. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is why did this one hit me so hard, right? Because, you know, I don't know Kobe Bryant, right? And, you know, people say that, oh, you don't know him. Why, why you know, why is this bothering hate, you so much? I hate people that don't understand well, say that stuff. I think one of the reasons why is because we actually, he's one of the people that we can say we actually watched him grow up. Right. Yeah. We watched him from a young age, you know, 17. You know, we saw his story of, of how, he, you know, how he got drafted and, you know, the prom with Brandy and, you know, this, you know, first his rap career, <laughs> you know, his rap career and, you know, winning championships and, you know, his potential indiscretions, you know, in Colorado and getting married and fighting for his relationship and then becoming a father and becoming a mentor to other players in the league and then, you know, having his kind of farewell tour and trying to chase Jordan and then, you know, falling short of six rings and then retiring and then all the great things that he's done after retirement and his business and entrepreneurship and philanthropy. And we've literally watched it. Yeah. We watched it for 25 years, really. And it was, you know, there are very few people that you can say that you can actually watch their growth and maturity. You know, I was never a Kobe Bryant fan for the longest period of time, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. And then he ended up kind of maturing into someone that I grew to respect. And so that's part of the reason why this situation is so unbelievably sad and why it feels personal, although I didn't know him. Yeah, I mean, I, just to touch on that for a second about not knowing the guy, what's crazy about this, and I noticed this and just... First of all, I'm glad we had three days to process this before we did um, the podcast because I don't think anyone um, could have really, really communicated and given this justice in the moments or the days after it happened, right? Because it's so deep. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that Kobe's impact specifically for for our generation, it's not just that we watched him grow up, but like I think people of our age, people who were teenagers or, or around Kobe's age when Kobe got drafted, who were Michael Jordan fans, mm -hmm. right? Like people don't understand, like if you were a Michael Jordan fan, like he was everything to kids. Yeah. Like if you were an athlete or anything, I wore Michael Jordan shirts, like mm -hmm. anything, everything, read his books, watched his VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. And then this guy comes in and, 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 it was hard for us to know how to feel about him at that time because we had such a personal connection to Jordan that we didn't want anyone to be like him. Yeah. Actually be like him. Right. Kobe came in and at 17, we resented the fact that he was trying to be like Mike. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that probably painted during that phase for me painted a, a long period of time where I didn't, fully appreciate him because I was so busy trying to make sure that people knew he wasn't as good as Jordan. Right. You right, know? Right. Um, but then as I matured, mm -hmm. right. And I grew into adulthood. I was like, wait a second, you know, Kobe and I share a favorite book called the alchemist. And I, and I look at it and his life, if you define it is, is pretty much that book. Mm hmm. You know, that's if you say, how did Kobe live his life? Um, as I was doing my research, he was actually writing a book with the guy who wrote The Alchemist. For people who don't know, it's 65 million sold. People swear by this book. And in it, they're talking about a personal legend. Mm -hmm. You know, 
chasing greatness or chasing a dream. Every single person on this earth has a purpose to live and to execute. And when that purpose is fulfilled, they leave this earth. Yeah. Right. Um, in a lot of ways, that's, that's, that's Kobe. He believed he's the only human being in this entire world of 8 billion people who believed that he could be better than Michael Jordan and actually did it. Like, that's the crazy thing. People are like, he just copied everything. He actually copied what Jordan did. Like, people don't understand what that means. And at the end of the day, I think that's what we're all trying to do, right? Like, we try to at least emulate the people who we think are great. And like you said, when we were younger, that was a knock on Kobe, partially yeah. because we had such a affinity for what Jordan did. But the reality is, that's what we're all trying to do, right, yeah. in, in our lives. Is we, if you we, don't have an example of greatness in your life to follow and emulate, how are you going to become great, Yeah, right? Yeah, And I think as I got older, I realized it. I was like, part of this is that no one actually could be Jordan. Yeah, We thought when Jordan retired, every basketball fan that you can talk to said, no one will ever be as good as Jordan. He's done things that nobody else can do. And Kobe literally did almost every single thing. He came up a championship short. And scored 81 points. And in scored game. 81 and 60 points <laughs> on, in, a, in his last game on a bad and leg. And that's the thing. And Kobe, you know, at... Whether you liked him or hated him, he gave you so many moments over the years. And that's, you know, it actually brings me to this post that somebody posted on social media. I think it was um, a mental health and wellness professional. And they said, why do we grieve people that we've never met? And they gave five reasons. I'm going to read them because I think it's very impactful. Number one, their work helped us get through a difficult time in our lives. And that one's interesting because I know a lot of Lakers fans who just, you know, they absorbed what Kobe did during those championships. And that literally took them, gave them a break away from what was going on in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's true for all fans um, of all sports and what championships can actually bring. People think it's just sports, but no, sports actually do provide a relief for a lot of people. Number two, their work inspired our dreams and goals. And when you look at Kobe, right, I mean... What do you when you think about Kobe in basketball? You think about work work ethic. If you hear any story that any player tells you, Jason Williams tells a story. Allen Iverson has stories about the type of work Kobe would put in. Guys were going to the club. Guys were going to party. Kobe was going to the gym. Yep. N number three, they modeled possibility. Number four, their death triggers our grief of previous losses. So a lot of us have had previous losses, and it reminds us of that. And then number five, their passing activates our fears around death, which I think is a big one because now, you you know, you, you look at Kobe and you say, you know, you look at life, for example, and you say, wow, you know, you know, you could die if you get cancer or, you know, a car accident. Those are things that you hear. They're all terrible. But and they're happening every day. They're happening every day to all kinds of people. But then there are certain people that you feel like are invincible that are kind of immune from these type of things happening to them. A helicopter crash. Like, it's just, it's not something that you think of is going to happen to Kobe. And it reminds you very quickly how much all of this stuff can be, you know, all, how life can, quickly life can be taken away from you. One of the things that's kind of been said a lot is like, let's not take the other, you know, eight people who died for granted right their mm -hmm. stories are all unique in different ways like i think in kobe's case we can make sense of it like we can not necessarily make sense of the death but put the death into context and say hey kobe lived a complete life mm -hmm. right and like you can understand maybe it was his time to go um but when you look at those three 13 year old girls mm -hmm. And you try to make sense of that. And it's like, especially knowing the story of Kobe's daughter, she wanted to be the greatest woman's basketball player of all time. Yeah. Like, why was that taken away from her? Mm -hmm. You know, all these stories, people are, are parents, you know, their yeah. coaches, their mentors. I mean, that's why this story is so personal because they can relate. There's almost like an individual in every single person in that plane that people from the age of five to the age of 90 can relate to. And, and I think on social media, you saw, you've seen the girl dad hashtag that's trending that, you yeah. know, was inspired kind of by the L. Duncan story that she told um, on ESPN and it's taken a life of its own. And it just shows you the inspiration uh, that he's had. And I, and I was, I told you this earlier um, before the show, I was talking to a friend who's from China who told me that China shut down. Like this isn't just, that's why this story is also 
so much bigger. It's not just oh, the impact he had here, but globally. China shut down. She yeah. said it shut down. Like people can't the whole world function. Is. People when are crying he... left and right. Like it's it's the impact is big. And one of the other things too, I think that's that that's starting to happen. And some of the you know even some of the research that you've done is people are starting to learn more about what he was contributing to the world, things that he was involved in. You know, maybe take us through a little bit of that before we jump in. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later in the show. We're going to be talking to Coach Bowles, the uh, head coach of Ohio University. We're going to be talking to a Lakers fan. Um, but before we do that, just run down some of the things that, you know, maybe people didn't know uh, that I think are you know, kind of instructive. Yeah, I think we really all have a great appreciation for who Kobe Bryant was as a basketball player. Mm hmm. But when you see, like you were saying, the reactions in China, part of the reason that was the case is that, you know, as a business person, as a marketing person, as a as an entrepreneur, you look at people and you say, how did they do that? And Kobe, from an early age, he was the first basketball player to understand the value of China and going over there, interacting with people, knowing and learning the language, right? Like he knew, it was almost like he had an innate ability to understand and an infinite curiosity that wasn't built on, I'm doing this for anyone else but myself. This is what I want out of life. These are the things that I'm going to chase. And that's why he was so successful as a businessman, because he knew through basketball and perfecting basketball that anything he put his mind to, he could be great at mm -hmm. as long as he cared about it. And so if you look at his business story and the things that were happening, part of the reason that we don't know as much as we should about Kobe is because he didn't do money, much of his thing, the things he did in life for us. Mm -hmm. He did it for himself. And we got, we were privileged enough that he was a public figure and we're able to witness it. Right. But like you look at the people who are responding, anybody who's ever chased greatness in any walk of life, Tim Cook from Apple is, is, is tweeting out about him. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic, the greatest, two of the greatest tennis players of all time talking about the influence that Kobe had on them. Mm -hmm. And it's because he gave us a blueprint for what it takes to be successful. Mamba mentality. The Mamba mentality. He created, it wasn't something that Nike created, like Air Jordan or King James. Kobe created his own mentality yeah. and said, this is the way that I live my life. And I think it's the right, if anybody follows these steps, they'll be successful as well. He's an investor in Fortnite, the biggest video game ever. He's an investor in Cholula Hot Sauce. Mm. He's an investor in Alibaba. The first movie script that he ever wrote won an Oscar. <laughs> his, his situation at Body Armor, which I'm familiar with in, in our relationship with the company, is instead of them, they were going to pay him millions of dollars in endorsements. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I'm going to invest $6 million of my own money because I believe in this product, give me 10% of 10% equ equity. Mm. Usually they negotiate equity instead of the money. Right. He said, no, if I'm involved in this, it's going to be successful. And I think there's something to be said at with mastering something, how that helps you in other walks of life. A lot of athletes walk away from the sport unwillingly. Yeah. Right? There's something left to give. We saw even with Jordan, he kept coming back, kept coming back. But Kobe actually knew that he gave it all he possibly could, and that phase of his life was complete. So people ask, well, he's the greatest example of a post-career athlete ever. The reason for that really is because he put in the work to be a great basketball player, and he knew what else he wanted to do and had a plan and applies that same work ethic, and that's true for all of us. If we all take the Mamba mentality and try. All of us can't be Kobe, right? There's a reason Kobe is Kobe. Mm -hmm. But if we just try and whatever it is that we're doing in life to simply just be the best at it, mm -hmm. you know, you'll get somewhere and do the work. That's, that's the most. And, and that's honestly for us, that's what Pilot Boys is all about. That's the Pilot yeah. Boys mentality. And uh, I guess the last thing I'll say about this, you know, for now, before we let's put a button on this for now, is that um, one of the things that's so evident and Kobe's life is that it shows you what's possible in life, right? If you work hard and you, you know, use the mama, Mamba mentality, in our case, the pilot boys mentality. And also it shows how you can write and rewrite your story. Yeah. You know, Kobe wrote and rewrote his story over and over again, 
many different chapters from number eight to number 24, from a guy who was a villain uh, to a guy who was a hero, uh, and realized that the story is never over yep. until it's over, you yep. know? And uh, it, it's just amazing to see someone like that who was, in a lot of ways, disliked by many people outside of Laker Nation and then turn their life into a, one where everyone now likes you. I mean, that's very rare to ever At see the that. Very le- I mean, he was chasing respect more than likability. Like, he wanted people to respect him, respect what he did. He didn't care if you liked him. Yeah. He was a person who was completely authentic and knew who he was. And that's what we all need to figure out, right? Like, a lot of us, life is crazy. Like, you interact with a lot of people. Sometimes you're like, the world is against me, this, that, and the other. Kobe is an example of, like, no matter what you're going through, if you know what you want out of this life, you're in complete control of your own destiny. Absolutely. No matter what happens. Absolutely. And that's 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 the number one lesson I think you we can take from him. And I guess the last thing I'll say also is just, you know, obviously he wasn't the only person on the helicopter. You know, us talking about him doesn't minimize their lives and their, and their impact that they had and their families. And um, RIP to all of them. Yes. And, um you know, we're prayers up for everybody that's involved in that scenario. Yep. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry I can't be with you tonight. However, I couldn't completely miss the chance to take a moment to share some thoughts with all of you. The lesson I cherish the most is how important it is to love what you do. If you love what you do and it's making you happy, all the hard work and perseverance will pay off. I once had a guidance counselor tell me that I shouldn't play basketball that it would never amount to anything for me. His negativity towards me made me stronger. You can't stop people from trying to limit your dreams, but you can stop it from becoming a reality. Your dreams are up to you. I encourage you to always be curious, always seek out things you love, and always work hard once you find it. So with that, I'll let you carry on with your evening. Please know I'm thinking of you, supporting you, and encouraging you always. Peace. Pilot Boys in the building. Welcome to the Pilot Boys podcast, where you'll get the real on all things sports, music, and pop culture. I am Mecca Don here with my co-host V. Mama mentality for life. Today is January 30th, 2020. This feels like the longest month of all time. (laughs) Thank you guys for tuning in. I know you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. On today's show, we will talk about the impact of Kobe Bryant with a lifelong Lakers fan, Will Guilford. We will talk to head coach of Ohio University basketball, Jeff Bowles, about his career, NCAA recruiting, D'Angelo Russell and Spike Lee stories, and more. And we'll also talk with our resident college football insider, Zach Smith, about the Bosa brothers and what to expect from OSU football in 2020. Shout out to our Patreon subscribers. Remember now that our $5 and up Patreon subscribers will get our episodes on Wednesdays a night early. These donations are very important and help keep our show going. If you want to help keep us on air, you can donate at www.patreon.com forward slash Pilot Boys Podcast. Let's go! Where the Pilot Boys at? Pilot Boys, we get on up. listening to the Pilot Boys podcast. Our next guest is a former college athlete, former assistant basketball coach at Ohio State, former head coach at Stony Brook, and now the head basketball coach at Ohio University. Please welcome to the show, Coach Jeff Bowles. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. This is this is awesome, man. We have uh, obviously a lot to talk about. Um, your journey has been, you know, amazing. And, you know, obviously we got to know each other a little bit while you were at Ohio State. And we're going to jump into all that. Uh, but the first thing we kind of want to talk to you about is is the Kobe Bryant situation. Obviously, you're a basketball person, and you tweeted something that I actually want to read uh, that I thought was very impactful, and then just get, get a couple thoughts from you on that. You said the impact of Kobe's death is global. The amount of people this has impacted or affected and reached is amazing. His work ethic, will to win, competitive nature was matched by few. Vanessa lost a soulmate and is burying a child, something no parent should ever have to do. And I thought that was very profound. First of all, there are a lot of different thoughts within that, right? There's um, 
there's the uh, impact, obviously, of him as a basketball player. There's the impact of him as a family man and as a father. And so I guess when you first heard the news, I'll just ask you this, you know, how did it, how did it impact you and what were some of your additional thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, number one, just, just such a tragic deal with nine lives lost and obviously Kobe being, you know, the the main person where everyone knew. And you know, I think the biggest thing is, you know, my heart dropped and my stomach, you know, had a pit in it and, and you didn't want to believe it. Right. And, you know, so many people feel like, you know, a guy like him's invincible and, you know, on top of the world, you know, retired, you know, raising his daughters and, and doing some external stuff outside of basketball. Um, you know, he was just starting his life and, you know, it's like, you know, I found out in between a film session and my players were crushed. Yeah. And as a coach, you know, that changed the dynamic of that day for us because, you know, when I grew up, it was Mike, you know, when these guys yeah. grew up, it was Kobe. Yep. You know, that, that was their Mike. And, you know, our, our guys were devastated. And, you know, so now it's like, you got to go into coach mode of, mentor and and talk about life and perspective and you know life is short and you know the value of you know every day and you know just changes things but i think he just you know it was a global deal and and even to today a few days afterwards you know this is going to be remembered for a long time and and um you know i was i was excited to see what he was doing outside of basketball what he was doing for women's basketball with his daughter and and um you know just phenomenal and you know he had some you know i read last night he had a a children's book uh coming out and the guy ended up deleting the script because he didn't want to finish it was it actually the author it was with the author of the alchemist the alchemist yep. which is his favorite yeah. book and if you look at kobe's life i say if you've read that book it's like kobe literally fulfilled that book he's like santiago yeah it's crazy that's a great book if anyone's not read it but mm-hmm. uh, i think just you know just the shock like everyone yeah. yeah. And and what what was it in, in your mind? I mean, obviously you study basketball and I'm sure you were a fan of Kobe and his approach. What 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 was it in your mind that made Kobe so great? And you know, from a coach's perspective, I'm sure you would love to have a player like that, not just talent wise, but mentality wise. I think the biggest thing, you know, he was a killer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he he held everybody accountable. And if you didn't match, you know, his effort level or will to win, like he was getting on you. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, just talking to some people and even, you know, D'Angelo was with him for a year. You know, I was watching the re- replay of his last game the other night and D- that was D'Angelo's rookie year. And, you know, he, that was kind of in his, you know, twilight years, but, you know, just his, his will to be great right. and his, his, his drive to be the best and, and everything he did. And, you know, you look at his Achilles injury, you know, making the two free throws and walking off just, right. you know, his, his toughness level. And, uh, you know, obviously he's a champion, um, you know, five times and you know, just his will to win and, and him just being a killer. And when you have a player like that, you know, I, I always wonder as a coach, how, how do you deal with that? Because it almost seems like they're like almost a, you know, a co-coach or a player coach, right? With that type of personality. How do you how do you actually coach a player like that? And how is it different from like the rest of the guys that you may have on your team? Yeah, the, the elite guys are different. Obviously, I've never been at that level and coached that type of person. But, you know, the, you know, Jared Saunders, Evan Turner, Daniel Russell's, you know, those those guys, you know, they think differently. They carry themselves differently. They act differently on the floor, off the floor. And then they're just they're just different. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's what separates. You know, everyone's got a talent and a God given ability. But, you know, the, the guys who do the extra and, and, you know, really work in their craft and watch the film and, you know, they're in the gym when, you know, not Snapchatting about it and, and you know, working, you know, when the, when the lights are off. So I just think that's a separator. And is there like a, a kind of, I don't, I don't want to use the word negative impact, but like the reality is that probably less than 1% of people in the world have Kobe's mentality, almost like mm-hmm. with his teammates and people that played with him. It's like the expectations that he had for himself other people probably really couldn't live up to them. That's just the reality, right? But he yeah, couldn't very, understand it, right? He couldn't understand. Yeah, it's very, very rare. And you know, guys like that, you know, sometimes get frustrated because they think the other people should have that, but they don't. You know, Evan Turner was like that when he was at Ohio State. He was, I mean, he was the national player of the year. He was so good. And sometimes he would make a play, and you know, he would see things happening before it happened, and somebody might not have been in the right spot or bobbled a ball. But you know, th- those guys, they, they, they help, 
elevate everyone else around them. That's what great players do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously, you know, we're going to continue talking about this. Like you said earlier, that his impact is is, is going to last a lifetime. And, um, you know, just like you said earlier, there are other people on that plane, uh, helicopter as well. And obviously we want to send our condolences to them. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit, though, and talk kind of about your journey, right? And your your rise through the kind of ranks of coaching and uh, you know, obviously starting off as a player. And I guess just tell us a little bit about your journey and how, how you kind of got to OU. Because when, you know, you got the, the head coaching job at OU, you said that was your dream job. And I believed you. You know, obviously you were a player there. Um, but t- talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, you know, I grew up in a small town, northeast Ohio, you know, born and raised. And uh, and I averaged 32 points a game, 12 and a half rebounds, first team all Ohio, Division three. What school did you school. go to? Uh, Sandy Valley High School. And, okay. And um, I, I actually tore my ACL in the North-South All-Star game at St. John Arena. Mm. Wow. And I was 17 years old, you know, thought my life was over. You know, crying, didn't know what was next. And, and I'm in the locker room or in the training room, and this huge guy walks up and starts talking to me. And it was Treg Lee. Oh, my God. Remember I remember Treg Lee, Perry and, Carter, all those guys. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, Treg was in there, and, you know, he didn't know me at all. But, you know, he just said, hey, it'll, it'll be okay. You just got to work hard. You know, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, the 17 year old kid and Treg Lee telling you that, you know, meant a lot. Yeah. But, um, you know, I was kind of damaged goods and I ended up walking on at Ohio University uh, my first two years. I uh, didn't practice or play my first year because of my ACL. And then my, my redshirt freshman year, I played 39 minutes the whole year. Mm, so wow. I didn't even play the equivalent of a game. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I was the guy like waving the town on the bench. We called ourselves the DMP crew. Did not play. <laughs> the, the original club right. crew, I, I, right? Hey, the original I, club yeah, the original. crew. I, I, that. <laughs> I was part of that crew at Ohio State, would, too. Uh, <laughs> we would go through warm-ups, and whoever scored the most points got to sit closest to the head coach. When, <laughs> You know, the other two guys were guards, so they were jacking threes, and I wasn't, so right. I, was, I was always by the team doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but after, after my freshman year, in my rest of freshman year, I'm like, this isn't going to happen again. You know, mm-hmm. I got to figure a way to get on the court. Yeah. Play with, you know, Geno Ford, Mr. Ohio Basketball, you know, Chad Estes, uh, Gary Trent, who ended up in the, the NBA. Shaq of the Mac. Mm-hmm. Yep, Curtis Simmons from Columbus. So, you know, I had to figure a way to get on the court. Yeah. So I got in the weight room, you know, got up to 245 pounds, benching 355, and became a defender, rebounder, you know, tough guy, mm-hmm. take charges, dive on the floor for loose balls. And that's really how I found the way on the floor and found my niche. And, uh, you know, got in the rotation my sophomore, junior, senior year. We won the uh, NCAA, or won the MAC tournament, went to the NCAA tournament, won the preseason at NIT, uh, beat Virginia when they were ranked, Ohio State at St. John. You know, just had a great, great career. And, yeah. and 20 games into my senior year, I blew my knee out for the third time. Oh, wow. And that kind of ended my career. We were 16 and four. And like most, you know, 22 year olds, you have no idea what you want to do in life. I was a biology major. Mm. So I wanted to be a physical therapist. That was my, my goal. And at the end of the year, our head coach at the time, Larry Hunter, you know, asked me if I'd be interested in coaching because he lost an assistant. Mm. At that time, it was the restricted earnings coach, uh, you know, where you can only make $16,000 a year. Wow. wow. And so, like, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, so I, I said, sure, and that's how I got into coaching. And I made $6,000 my first year. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't regret it. I, you know, forever grateful he gave me an opportunity. And, and uh, you know, 25 years later, here we are. Wow. So did you, like, when you had that third third knee injury, right, and the game was taken taken away from you, um, were, how, how difficult was like that time or, or facing the reality that you, there's just nothing that you could, you could do was, was that, that, uh, probably a very personal soul searching time, correct? Yeah. It's kind of funny. You know, it was at Eastern Michigan. There was 12 NBA scouts there. And I blew my ACL and I'm like, Oh, I just blew my chance. Mm. And you know, they're there for Gary Trent, but you know, I, I wasn't playing on playing afterwards. You know, I don't, I, I wasn't pre- that, that good, but it, it's, it's one of those deals. And I heard, you know, Kobe talking about it on, a, on one of his uh, talk shows, you know, the finality of your career or your playing time, you know, what do you do afterwards? Yeah. And there, there's a big void, you know, you miss the locker room, you miss the competition. Um, you miss the, the camaraderie. And, you know, for me, it kind of bumped everything up. You know, a couple months, 
you know, because it came real. It's like, Hey, you, your, your career's over. You know, yeah. what are you going to do mm-hmm. next? And I had started applying to physical therapy schools and really had, you know, didn't know what I wanted to do. And, you know, it's, it's a scary deal when you don't know in yeah. the unknown. Yeah. And then when the opportunity came, you know, I took it and really didn't know what coaching entailed. And, you know, you don't get into coaching for the money. Right. And mm-hmm. w- once you start getting into it and really realize why you're doing what you do, you know, the impact you can have on young men, the servanthood, you know, you, you're helping shape, you know, young men and uh, being productive citizens in the real world Right. is what, yeah. what it boils down to. And, you know, I've, I've been around a lot of great people. Um, and I think the most satisfying thing as a coach now is getting those texts on Father's Day, you know, yeah. Christmas holidays, you know, seeing the, the families that these kids are having now, the success they're having, um, you know, after basketball, that, that's, you know, gratifying. You know, one thing about coaching, too, that I've, I've always been curious about is kind of the, you know, the difference between kind of what it what it means to be an assistant coach versus being a head coach. And, you know, you've, you've been both. Obviously, you were assistant coach with Thad at Ohio State for a while before you took the Stony Brook job and then obviously before you got to OU. And it seems like, you know, the assistant coaches are like the unsung heroes, especially in basketball. I feel like in, in, in football, you hear about them more. Who's the offensive coordinator? You know who the coordinators are. But in basketball, you don't hear about them as much. But when you talk to head coaches, a lot of times you'll, you'll hear them say, oh, you know, if it wasn't for this guy, this coach, I wouldn't even be here. You know, so talk to us a little bit about that, the difference in your mind between, you know, what it was like to be an assistant coach versus now what it's like to be a head coach. Yeah, it's it, there's a big difference. You know, as assistant, you know, you're you're you know given ideas and and thoughts. You know, as a head coach, you're making every decision mm-hmm. from recruiting to compliance to academics to travel to you know everything. And you know, you're really the CEO, right? Yeah. And you know, you always you always hear it. You know, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, as a head coach, you're you're a, a manager, you're a delegator. And that's probably the biggest difference from going from an assistant to a head coach that I struggle with is delegating. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you've always done things on your own. And, and, and you know, from, you know, Division Two Charleston to, you know, Robert Morris, and then you become the head coach, you can't do everything on your own. Right. And that's why you have to have people you trust and that are loyal, you know, because it, it's a tough profession, especially nowadays with the social media. Yeah. You know, the coaching world has changed in the last five, seven years. Um, from recruiting to, you know, just, you know, you got thousands and thousands of, you know, social media people telling you what to do and yeah. right, you know, it's just changed. And yeah. so I think the biggest thing is just delegating and really surround yourself with people you can trust and, you know, that are going to, you know, help, help the program. I specifically wanted to ask you about the OU job. I think I read somewhere that you said it's your dream job. And obviously, you know, being OU being your, your alma mater, alma mater, um, can you just take us into that feeling as like how you felt when it kind of came full circle from a player that you gave your all to, to now being able to lead this team? Like why that, could you just tell us why it's your dream? Yeah. So, you know, when I was in Ohio State, it, it was actually open twice. And the, the one time, you know, we were 34 and three, number one, in the country got upset in the sweet 16 and, and I didn't get the job, which I didn't think I was ready for the job at that point. Mm-hmm. And then the second time it opened was the year we went to the final four in 2012. And you know, I, I really felt I was ready to make that jump. And the AD at the time, Jim Shouse, his you know thought process was hiring a sitting head coach. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I wasn't a sitting head coach, so he ended up not hiring me. And, you know, that kind of hurt at the time, but I understood now, you know, that was his, you know, thought process and, and, you know, we, we kept on making runs in the NCAA tournament. You know, there were some jobs, interviews that I didn't even go on uh, because we were going to the Sweet 16 Elite Eight, you know, and I didn't feel right interviewing for jobs while we were trying to win a national championship. So, you know, I, I missed out on some opportunities, but I, I, I don't have – I have zero regrets because my whole thought process was helping Thad Mon and Ohio State win a national championship. Mm-hmm. And I ended up getting an agent, you know, after that, you know, uh, Final Four run – you know, just because someone to do the background and the legwork, you know, where, where I didn't have to worry about it. And, and it's hard to get a division one head coaching job, especially yeah. a good one. Yeah. Yeah. There's only 354 of them. Yep. And my job as an assistant Ohio state was better than a lot of head coaching jobs. Yeah. yeah. And Thad always told me, don't ever leave here for a bad job. You know, make sure it's a top three job 
resource, budget, you know, facility, all that stuff. So when Stony Brook called me, I really had no idea about Stony Brook. And once I did my research, it was a young university that just went to the NCAA tournament for the first time, just went division one, 99, 2000. And once I went out there, I fell in love with the place. Um, the president was awesome. The AD was great. And fortunately I got hired and, you know, my first year we kind of overachieved ended up finished second in the league. We were picked, um, I think seventh, you know, my second year we were picked fifth, finished fourth. And then my third year we were picked fifth and we ended up finishing second. And I had no intentions on leaving there. We, we had 11 freshmen, sophomores, you know, finished 24 and eight, uh, you know, last year mm -hmm. beat South Carolina, Rhode Island, George Washington, Northern Iowa, that's you know, those we are real teams. Back. Yeah. And, you know, I had a couple other calls, you know, about, you know, jobs and, and then, oh, you called and I was, you know, that, that's the one that piqued my interest. Yeah. And, um, you know, the tough thing about coaching is your family. You know, I got a wife and two kids and, you know, you sacrifice a lot, you know, with kids activities. And, you know, that's why I kind of hit home with the Kobe deal, yep. you know, just, you know, why he got a helicopter. You know, so he could go work out, fly back, and pick his kids up at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's being a parent. You know, just because you have a job doesn't mean you stop being a parent, stop being a husband. Right. And so this move back was it was a family decision. And you know, my my daughter's 16; she's lived in seven different cities. Wow. And you know, it's tough on them, you know, for for moving around. But and you know, it's worked out. And obviously, Ohio University called me, and it worked out. And, and I'm just elated. One of the things that uh, you you just mentioned that obviously piques our interest, obviously, is is Thad Mata and your relationship with him. Uh, you know, it, he's obviously a, a historical figure in Ohio State coaching history, right? Not just basketball, but just in general. And what he did for the Ohio State program kind of resurrected it from, you know, what we thought it could be, and, and really turned it into really a national powerhouse every like you said every year you mentioned a, m a bunch of different years you're talking about sweet 16s and final fours that became something that was kind of became the expectation at ohio state talk to us a little bit about his impact on you um and and your style of coaching and just your relationship with him as well yeah it's it's kind of a funny story how i got the job you know timing is everything being in the right place i was at university of akron you know, we'd won like 24, 26, and 25 games in the three years I was there. And at the time, um, Sean Miller left and went to Arizona as the head coach. Well, Chris Mack calls me and says, hey, I'm going to get this job, but it's not going to be for another week. You know, we got to go through the interview process. I want you to come down and be my associate head coach. And, and I was like, done, I'm in. You know, Chris and I were tight. So a lot of people don't know for about, three or four days I was heading to Xavier. Mm. And then when Sean left to go to Arizona, he called Archie who was at Ohio state with Thad, and said, Hey, I want you to come out to Arizona with me. So I get a call on Easter Sunday. It was an unknown caller and I answer it. And I only know one guy who was an unknown caller. <laughs> and the guy was a former FBI. He was an FBI guy is assistant coach at Dayton. He was Adrian Payne's assistant. Mm. So I had messed up one time uh, writing him a letter. I wrote the wrong name and sent him a letter, and I realized I did it. So I called him and said, hey, you know, you're going to get a letter. I was talking to somebody on the phone. I wrote this letter. You know, my apologies. He said, no problem. So I get this unknown call on Easter Sunday, and I answer it. And they're like, Jeff. I said, yes. He said, this is Thad Mata, the head coach at Ohio State. I was like, hey, coach, what's up? So I'm talking for about a minute. I'm thinking it's this former this fbi guy this assistant coach messing with me <laughs> <laughs> so literally for a minute i had no idea it was thad and after a while i'm like holy shit this is thad <laughs> right. so we talked for about a half hour and he goes hey i just lost an assistant archie to you know arizona you know i know it's easter sunday i got some family things i gotta do but i want to see if you're interested if you are we can talk later tonight and i said definitely so you know i talked later that night and then the next day I drive down to his house and I met with him for four hours, um, you know, from eight till midnight. And then, um, he called me up Tuesday. I was walking into the dentist chair, literally like going to sit down and I get this unknown call again. He's like, Hey, can you meet me right now in Mansfield? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> right. So I tell the dentist, I got to leave and I walk out and meet him in a cracker barrel in Mansfield. And, you know, he ended up offering me a job in Mansfield and I took it and, it was tough to call Chris, but, you know, just, you know, at that, at that time, 
you know, working for Thad and being at Ohio State was was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think also with we're in talking about Thad and and what he did at Ohio State and and you know, everybody hears about basketball recruiting, how tough it is. It's to me the toughest sport to recruit in, right? Especially the elite elite talent. Um, that Thad was able to bring to a football school like Ohio State, right? Like some of the players you recruited include D'Angelo Russell, um, Jared Sollinger. People traditionally didn't before Thad got here. Ohio State was getting very good basketball players, Mr. Basketball in Ohio, but they weren't getting those type of players. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk us through how Thad was able to do that? Because when you think of basketball, you think of Duke, Kentucky, those type of programs where the football program isn't as strong, it seemed like you guys were really, real, really able to have Ohio State basketball make an imprint on probably the biggest football school in the country, right? Yeah, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head with, you know, there probably was no better coach than Thad Mata to be the head coach of Ohio State because, number one, all he wanted to do was coach his team and spend time with his family. And as you well know, you know, it's Ohio State football – and then spring football mm-hmm. and, <laughs> <seasons>. yeah. <laughs> and so he, he didn't want the limelight, you know, you know, he, he was happy just coaching his team and there was no one better. You know, there was no ego involved with that. And I think the, the best thing that I tell people at the time that, um, that I end up leaving, I think he had been there nine years. You know, he had five regular season championships and four tournament big 10 tournament championships. So at the time, you know, in his tenure in, in Ohio State, he had nine championships overall. The next closest was Tom Izzo with five. Wow. And that just kind of shows you the dominance he had in that league while, you know, well, the, the nine years before I left. And I think the best thing about that is, and I tell people what he did with all those championships, the Final Fours, the Elite Eights, the way he did it was amazing in, in that era. Because, you know, he didn't cheat. Um, he was very ethical. And the climate of, you know, you, you saw the stuff that has come out the last you know, couple of years. Yeah. The way he did it is just amazing and how much he accomplished to me. Yeah. Talk yeah. to us about that a little bit, too, because, you know, you hear a lot about college recruiting. And obviously, we're, we're in sports, so we, we hear probably more than the average person. But you, met, you also mentioned, like, how Thad, Thad did it. He did it in a very clean way. He ran a clean program. You didn't really hear about any scandals. How pervasive is cheating, I guess, in, in college basketball specifically? And how do you deal with that as a coach who doesn't want to go that route, knowing that you're competing against people who people? are? Yeah. Influence. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's difficult in the sense of you're not getting the elite players like you mentioned. And, you know, obviously, if you look at the great players, they've all been – you know, within a, probably a three, four hour radius of, of Ohio State's campus. And when Ohio high school basketball players are, you know, good, you know, Ohio State's good. Mm-hmm. And I think if you look at the climate of, of recruiting, you know, and what's transpired, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what's happened because there's a st- still a lot of unknowns out there, you know, from the FBI deal and the NCAA deal of, of you know, what they're going to do to some of these schools. Right. And, you know, as an assistant coach, you know, your job is to get players mm-hmm. and, you know, sometimes, you know, people do it at whatever cost they, they, they can. Mm-hmm. And I think as an assistant for Thad, it was, it was good knowing that if you didn't get a player, he knew why and he was fine with that because he wasn't going to do it. Right. So, yeah. you know, as an assistant, knowing that he knew that, you know, there wasn't that pressure of, you know, doing something that you shouldn't have been doing. And, and um, you know, there's enough good kids out there who want it on the back end that, you know, we were able to find. And can, can you take us into specifically the one that, that always fascinated me as a fan of basketball is how you guys were able to convince D'Angelo Russell to come here as a Louisville kid, right? Anyone who's mm-hmm. in Kentucky understands basketball in that state, Kentucky, Louisville, hometown kid, pretty much people, Rick Pitino there. Can you, how did you guys get that win? And, and he was one of the biggest recruits could have gone to any program in the country. Like, I know you were very heavily involved in that recruitment. That one's the one that fascinates me the most. How did that happen? Yeah, the first time I went down and saw D'Angelo in Louisville was uh, his sophomore year. And um, you know, he ended up leaving that year to go to Mount Verde. And, um, you know, it's probably about a three-and-a-half-hour drive. So, you know, it was 
pretty close proximity. Um, he played for the Louisville Magic at the time, you know, and I, I knew the coach, you know, pretty well, who was actually an ex-Louisville player. And I think D'Angelo going away from home to Mount Verde, you know, helped us in that sense because he was already away from home. And, um, you know, he went went down there his junior year, soft, into sophomore year, junior year. And there was a point he was thinking about leaving because Coach Boyle, you know, wasn't playing him in four quarters because he wasn't playing defense. And, you know, his dad basically told him, hey, look, you're staying there. You know, it's the best thing for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being at Mount Verde, you know, you're around a lot of other great players. I mean, he was down there with, you know, Ben Simmons. And there, there was an African kid like running like six, eight, running up and down the court during open gym. And I'm looking at this kid like, who is this kid? Right. Yeah. He's raw. And I go back later in the year and the kid's not even there. And the kid didn't even play for him, didn't, really didn't even get in practice. You know, it was in open gym. And at the end of the year, I, f- I hear this name from the Rock School going to Kansas, Joel Embiid. Wow. I'm like, that was Joel Oh, my, oh my gosh. God. Wow. And, you know, he wasn't even playing at the time. Right. And uh, so he was around a lot of great players. And Coach Boyle's a great coach. Ray Miller, the assistant's a great guy. And, you know, he really matured then. And, you know, we just kept recruiting him and recruiting him. And, you know, it came a time where at the end of his junior year, he came up. Uh, the campus right after, uh, like around June 1st, on an unofficial visit. It was dad, it was him, and his AAU coach. And, you know, we're sitting there, and, and D'Angelo loves it. And he wants to commit. It was like June 1st. And his dad was like, you're not committing. And D'Angelo was like, well, why do we even come up here if I can't commit? I want to be a Buckeye. This is where I want to go to school. Wow. And the dad's like, hey, you know, you need to go visit a couple other schools first. And Deanne's like, I don't want to visit any other schools. You know, we shouldn't even come up here if I didn't, you know, if, if I wasn't going to commit. So Thad and I are sitting there watching them argue, and we're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so they end up going back on uh, that Thursday, and they had a family meeting with the, his two brothers and, and his dad and him. And then, um, you know, two days later, I remember I was at a, a pool party for my kids, uh, you know, swim team. And I get a phone call on June 7th. It was a Friday night. And, uh, you know, he commits to us. And um, wow. you know, I think D'Angelo did it for the right reason. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a great blueprint for him. You know, he and Thad had a great relationship. It was three and a half hours from home. You know, he knew he was going to come in and play right away. And then, um, you know, his first year on campus, we thought he'd probably be there for two years. And the first scrimmage that we had was at, at West Virginia. You know, they're pressing him 94 feet. They're up in him, you know, and, and he ends up with 33 points, eight assists, and hit the game winning three. And right afterwards, Thad looks at us and goes, hey, boys, we better find a new point guard because he's not going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. hilarious. That is so funny. I think he was the number three overall pick, right? Yeah, number two. Number two. Lakers. Yeah. Number two. And one thing, uh, you know, that kind of brings me to also is I just want to, you know, get a couple of your thoughts on, like, the NCAA as it relates to the NBA. Obviously, on this show, we have a few gripes with the NCAA. We're not going to try to get you in trouble there. But curious just on your Appreciate thoughts. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, we understand. Uh, but we do want to get your thoughts on kind of like the one and done rule, whether or not guys should be restricted from going to the NBA, and a little bit on your thoughts on the likeness thing that's happening um, as well in the NCAA. Yeah, I think, you know, if, if you look at it, the NCAA has no say in the one and done, two and done. It's all you know, by the NBA Players Association. Right. Mm-hmm. And you got to realize what the NBA is trying to do. They're trying to build a brand and a, a marketing deal where, you know, Zion Williamson goes to Duke for a year and there's all this hype, you know, and then he comes into the NBA. Well, now people know about him. Right. And th- there's a build up to it. And if you look at Zion now, I mean, the, the incredible hype uh, leading up to him playing his first game, and rightfully so, but, you know, if, if you come right out of high school, you're not going to have this kind of build up. Right. You know, yeah. So that's where like a one and done and two and done came. And, you know, now they're going to switch and leave. I think it might be next year, 2021, you know, leave leaving out of high school if they want to. And, you know, my thing is, you know, how are you going to tell somebody they can't earn a living? You know, yeah. who, you know, and it, it's it's easier in basketball than, say, football, like football. That's a man's game. Right. You know, basketball, you can get away with your athleticism. You know, you're still physically maturing and growing, but, you know, you don't peak until you're like 26 years old in the NBA. Right. You know, that's your prime years. And I think, you know, 
it, it'll change some of the schools who do the one and dones, you know, where those kids aren't going to college, they're going right to the NBA or there's, you know, some other platforms they can do, you know, see guys going to Australia now, right. Um, you know, RJ Hampton and, uh, LaMelo ball. So, yeah, you know, th- those, those type of opportunities will be there, but I think, you know, the landscape has changed and, you know, the national, the image and likeness is it's real. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to have to do something. I, I don't know what, but, you know, they're, they're, there, there'll be something to be done, you know, just based on, you know, the state laws that are happening. And I, I think to me, I hope, I think the incident of waste hoping that they make it a federal law, right? you know, where it's blanketed across every state as opposed to Florida having their own world laws, California having their own laws, et cetera. Right. And go ahead. And in terms of like what that means for for you, like as a coach, the difference, like when you had a one and done in D'Angelo Russell, how does that impact the development of the program? Right, like you have this like superstar come in, burn bright, and then the next year you he's gone, right? And the rest of the guys on the team, you're who essentially were built around him, now have to build without him. How does that impact coaching? And, and do you pr- prefer as a, as a college coach being able to have a guy for four years or do you understand the value of having a one and done and the impact that that can have? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think you understand the value of it. You know, th- those guys are elite and, and you know, it, it's, it's amazing. A lot of times the better players you have, the better coach you are. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy how that happens. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you have you have pros on your team, you know you're in the mix for league championships and national championships. Yeah. And you know, if you look at the teams who end up winning it, you know they got three, four, five pros on that team. Yep. Right. And so you're not going to turn a kid like that down. You know that's going to be there six to eight months. And I think the biggest thing is you have to pre- be prepared for it, knowing that those kids are going to leave. And you know, with with D'Angelo and even I think Thad will tell you, you know, he wasn't expecting Mike Conley to leave after one year. Right. Yeah. He knew he was really good, you know, but, you know, B.J. Mullins, Greg Oden, uh, um, those guys, they he, he thought those guys would leave after one year. So you bring in um, Costa Kufas behind him and, yep. you know, Jaron Soldier behind him. But, you know, with D'Angelo, we thought he was going to be there for two years. And, you know, you can't, you know, when a kid plays out of his mind and, and plays great, you know, that early and, and you're not prepared for it, that's, that's when it hurts you. Right. Yeah. So one last question kind of about the basketball before we switch over to some a little different is the pressure the pressure to win and I think that part of you know this conversation is especially as being a head coach I think is is steering me to this question is how serious is the pressure to win because I as a head coach like you said there're only 354 of you guys in the whole country and these jobs are coveted and, you know, there there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we don't necessarily know about in athletic programs and athletic directors and politics and all that boosters, all that type of stuff. How serious uh, is that pressure to win? Yeah, it's it's real. And you know, I think, number one, you can't lose sight of why you're coaching, mm-hmm. you know, but at, on, at the same token, it's your it's your job. It's your it's your livelihood. And, you know, 18 to 22 year olds, that's your livelihood, you know, what they do off the court, how they do in the classroom, how they perform on the court. So there, there's a lot of pressure, you know, from that standpoint. And that's why I think, you know, sometimes you get in a situation where it's like your back's against the wall. What are you going to do? Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you look at a, the major league baseball when they went through the steroid era, mm-hmm. you know, those guys are batting 200 and it's like, Hey, my livelihood of making one to 2 million bucks a year. If I take a cycle. Yep. You know, and I'm hitting 32 home runs. I'm getting an extension. Mm-hmm. It's, it's worth the the, the for them. Yeah. But you know, I think the pressure is real, and I think with social media and every game being on TV, you know, it even adds up to it more. And then, you know, you look at the elite, you know, high to major level. You know, a lot of those kids, you know, are, are thinking they're NBA players. Mm-hmm. So there's pressure on them, and there's externals. I call them the, you know, family members, the coaches, the runners and agents that are telling the kid you got to shoot more. You're getting looked off. You know, you should be playing more. And there, there's so many things, people in these kids ears, you know, sometimes you feel bad for them, but you know, I think there's a lot of pressure and, and um, you know, to obviously it's a wins and loss business. Right. And t- talk to us a little bit about your team, about your current team, uh, OU basketball. You know, I see you guys have had some 
a, a pretty good season. Probably by your standards, it's not good enough because I know how you are. But talk to us a little bit about about your guys, uh, your team, and and how you see you know the next few years playing out. Yeah, so you know we we have a young team this year. We started the year with seven freshmen and uh, three sophomores, and and then one junior, two seniors. And so we we have a lot of you know unproven young guys who really never played. Right. And to me, I was looking at this year as a growth process, like our growth, you know, game to game, day to day, week to week, as opposed to results. And you know, now you know we're in conference play, we're two and six, but we could easily be six and two, seven and one. Right. And it's such a fine line of winning and losing. And you know, last night we lost by two points. Yeah. I saw that. Um, Akron, we lost by two points. You know, we lost by nine to Toledo. So we, we've lost a lot of one, two, three possession games. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's a matter of learning how to win, you know, making the game winning plays when you need to. And, and as a coach, you know, you know, how do you, you know, respond with a young group losing all these close games? You know, you got to stay positive. You got to work harder. Right. And, and, and that's the biggest thing, you know, fighting adversity. Mm-hmm. And you know, I use the Tim Kite equation, E plus R equals O all the time with my guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, here's the event. What's our response going to be? Mm-hmm. And, you know, athletics, as you well know, you know, it, it's the parallel that teaches you life lessons, mm-hmm. how to deal with adversity, teamwork, you know, you know, all those things that add up uh, adversity, um, self-discipline, discipline. And, you know, that's, there's so many life lessons involved with athletics and, and I think with our guys, you know, we continue to coach them and teach them, and you know, we're going to win these close games you know, sooner than later. Right. It and, seems uh, like it seems like you your coaching philosophy is built on defense first, right? Like we can control that and get that together, and and that can prevent other teams from scoring on you. Is, and and that's why everywhere you've gone, you see close games. Um, you know how how why is that so important to you? Like the defensive side of the ball. And it's rare in today's era of basketball where we see Steph Curry and all these guys to have a coach that 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 preaches the importance of defense. Yeah, if you if you would watch our Toledo and Akron game, you wouldn't have thought that. But yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> think if you really look at it, you know, it, when it comes down to championship season, whether it's you know your conference or end of the year or even in some way, you're winning the thing, you know, by half court defense and rebounding, mm-hmm. and that's got to be a staple because. A lot of times the ball might not go in the basket like it did last night, but our defense was pretty good and gave us a chance to win the game. And, you know, that, that's got to be a staple of, of your program. Just, you know, understanding the value of a possession that every possession matters. And, you know, we're, we got 10 games left and we're going to be in a lot of close games the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. And you know, we have to understand the mentality of, you know, a loose ball, a missed block out, you know, not running back in transition. So all those little things add up to be big things. Right. And one, one thing that I think obviously some of our listeners, Ohio State fans, are going to uh, want, you, want to hear your perspective on, uh, and I guess this is the last question we'll ask you about, about basketball, is the current Ohio State program. And I know you, you're busy with your own program and you're not necessarily focused on that. But it's interesting to see, you know, what's happened since that has left and the transition to Holtman, which who, who I happen to like. Just wanted to get kind of your thoughts on Ohio State basketball, if you've had any chance to pay attention to it. Yeah, I'm I'm a big Chris Holman fan. I've known Chris for a while, and and you know he's in a mold of that. He's gonna do things the right way. He's gonna work hard to do it. He's gonna have a lot of pride in the university. And you know, I, I had a chance to go see him practice in the fall. And you know, very similar to us, they had a young team. You know, they had a couple of returners, but you know, th- those guys take time to grow. And you know, they had some early success. Um, you know, that that might end up hurting them a little bit, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he's got got it going back in the right direction, but you never know the mindsets of 18 to 22 year olds. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you handle adversity? How do you handle prosperity? Right. Um, those two things are huge. And I think, you know, win- winning's hard, man. Like yeah. it's hard to win, especially when you're a uh, hunted. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, I always said that the year we started out, I think 26 and 0 end up 34 and three. The best thing about that group you know, they brought their A game every single game because when you're at Ohio State, it doesn't matter who you're playing, what their record is. You know, you could watch a tape, a scouting tape. You're not playing that same team. Right. You know, yeah. the, the atmosphere is up. The student section's up. Yeah. You know, the energy level's up. And same thing with Ohio State football. The most impressive thing to me 
is you're getting everyone's A plus game. Yep. No matter if they're two and eight or eight and two. Yep. 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 And I think people don't realize that a lot in sports, especially like you said, uh, when you're at the top of your game and it's nothing more than the coach's dream and all of the players' dream to beat you even once. That literally is the story they'll tell for the rest yep. of their life if they can make it happen. Yep. Yeah, and, and and that was the one thing here is like it's it's fairly unique the ebb and flow right like I remember what when they beat Kentucky John Calipari saying this is one of the three best teams in America and it's almost like that might have been the worst thing it seemed like everything went downhill from there how do you handle like the ebb and flow of the regular season and then uniquely in basketball the thing I always say is March Madness is the craziest thing in any sport right single elimination tournament you anyone can lose to anyone and 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 how do you kind of get them back to the tournament mindset and feeling like they can they can win it in, in not just this situation any situation in coaching yeah that's that's probably one of the most difficult things is you know keeping an even keel you know because if you win a game like that you're getting you know bruises on your back from all the pats you know, the social <laughs> media. you know if you lose a game and go one for 11 you know you're you're reading on twitter you suck you right. don't deserve yeah. a scholarship Go kill yourself while you're here. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And I don't care who you are. That negativity, you know, bleeds into your brain. And, you know, that's the toughest thing about coaching is, you know, trying to keep your guys consistent. Yeah. The most consistent teams are the ones who win. And, you know, I always say it, it's almost harder to win a, a league championship than it is a national championship because you're playing round robin, away games, tough atmospheres, Whereas you get to the NCAA tournament, it's luck, it's draw, yeah. it's matchups, it's an injury, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, at the high major level, you're going to play a, a low, low to mid major team first round, maybe a low high major team second, you know, you, you, and then you're going to sweet 16, you're going to be into it. Right. And, you know, you got to win, you know, six games and obviously it's tough to do, but, you know, you're playing 18 to 20, you know, regular season games against high major opponents home and away. And, you know, it's like I said before, man, it's tough to win. Yeah. yeah, very tough to win. So I want to switch gears before we get you out of here. We, uh, you know, like to do some a couple of fun things before, uh, you know, we get you out of here on these on this show and uh, talk about some trying to get, you know, because I think one thing about about life now, like you said, and you, you've alluded to this with social media is you kind of, you know, learn about people and you feel like you know them right based on things that you see on social media and you know, sometimes you do get to know people a little bit more and sometimes, you know, you don't, don't. You, you don't. Right. <laughs> so I think for here, we talk, like to get um, two two different lists because I think it helps kind of just illustrate to people who you actually are. So the first list we like to get is your top five musicians of all time, the the musicians that influenced you in your life. Top five. It, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of all over the map. Like I listen to every genre, every type of music and. Yeah. That should I, make I for a good my, list. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's going to be kind of random. You know, my, my my favorite ever is probably Biggie. You know, I'm a I love Biggie. I, I love think it. his lyrics and you know, you really listen to what his lyrics are. There's a lot of meaning behind. Oh, I'm it. sure that played well in Stony Brook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm a big Jay Z guy. Mm -hmm. I love Jay Z. Um, uh, uh, Zach Brown Band is mm -hmm. one yeah. of my favorite bands. Yep. Um, I think the Pearl Jam, you know, I kind of, oh, I love, I love this list. This list is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Pearl Jam. And, and, um, I don't think you can ever go wrong with Jimmy Buffett. You know, those concerts are crazy. I think that's and, Urban Meyer's favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I mean this, you know, the, the whole Key West vibe, you know, so it's kind of a random crazy list, but I'm going to go Biggie, Jay-Z, um, you know, Jimmy Buffett, Pearl Jam and Zach Brown. And, if I th could throw a six in there, I'd throw Eminem in there. Okay. Nice. Eminem, honor nice. Our, honorable our mention. Yeah, honorable right. mention. <laughs> right. And, and the second list is um, your top five athletes um, and, and why and how they influenced you. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of different criteria for the best athletes, but I would look at it as people maybe transcend their sport or, or really engage me to watch them. Right. Yeah. And, and and I, I would have to go obviously with Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. um, LeBron James uh, would be number two. Mm -hmm. uh, Serena Williams mm -hmm. would be three. Mm -hmm. um, Tiger Woods would be four, mm -hmm. and probably the fifth one 
would be, you know, I mean, I was, I was a marshal when he played there. I'd say Randy Moss. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, you know, just watching him, you know, up close and, you know, getting to know him. You know, he, he was a two time uh, basketball state high school player of the year. You know, yeah. A lot of people don't know that. A lot yeah. of people you know, played with Jason yeah. Williams. Him and Jason White Williams Charlie. played together, right? Yeah, it was Jason Williams, Bobby Howard, who was a linebacker at Notre Dame, and Randy Moss. And they never wow. won a state championship in West Virginia. It's crazy. Wow. That is crazy. Yo, thank first of all, thanks so much, man. This is this was a great interview. Very, very comprehensive. Learned a lot. Uh, you know, I think one of the like I said on social media, I think you and I fr- kind of first met probably on social media, right? Just yeah. just following each other and uh, just developed a relationship through there. And we've really, really enjoyed watching your career. And obviously, you know, it's there's many more heights that it's going to go to. V and I got to get down there to a to a game to Athens and and watch you guys play. Something. Yeah. Like, one, one more quick story before we go about yeah. the power of social media. Yeah. When I was at Ohio State, Spike Lee was coming to speak at uh on campus. Mm-hmm. So I just like threw him out at Spike Lee. Hey, saw you on campus. Love to have you at basketball practice. Let me know. Not thinking I'd hear anything from him. Wow. Next thing you know, I get a message back from Spike Lee. <laughs> oh my I'm God. like, oh my gosh, Spike Lee. So ends up, we end up going picking him up at the, uh, the uh, hotel. And he came over to our practice before he spoke that night on campus. And he sat there for two hours on the baseline and watched our whole practice. Oh my God. Wow. And afterwards he came, you know, he got in the huddle and talked to our guys and he went around. He's like, what's your major? What's your major? What's your major? And basically, after he asked that, he's like, don't ever do anything for money. Don't pick a major for money. Don't pick a job for money. You know, pick something that you're passionate about that you have a love for. Because, you know, once you do that, money's not going to matter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that always stuck with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, him talking to our guys like that. But it, the power of social media and, and you know, what it, what it can, you know, draw people to was big. But I really appreciate you guys having me on. And, um you know, I'm sure we'll uh, cross paths here soon. Oh, for yeah, sure. Fine. That was great, man. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for joining us on Pilot Boys Podcast. Talk to you soon. All right. See you guys. Love the Pilot Boys Podcast? Support us on Patreon. Supporters can pledge as little as $1. And we have some cool perks on there. Check out www.patreon.com forward slash Pilot Boys Podcast. Show us some love today. Uh, tell me about your dunk. What do you remember about that play? Uh, all I remember was Cole telling me that I've been going to the to the hole like a light skinned dude, so I got to start going like a dark skin. So when I seen the lane open up, that's all I remember. You went to the hole like a dark skinned dude. Yeah. yeah. Uh, You're listening to the Pilot Boys podcast. Our next guest, William Guilford, is an attorney at law and also a lifelong Lakers fan. You've heard us talk to him before. Um, we're going to bring him in to talk a little bit about Kobe. Welcome to the show, Will. Hey, what's up, Mac? What's up, V? What's going on? Well, this this is uh, uh, obviously a crazy week, right? You know, when, you know, I don't know what you ever expect in life, but I know one thing for sure is when, you know, you didn't expect to hear that Kobe Bryant was going to die in a helicopter crash this week. You know, if there are a hundred things that you expected right. to hear, that was not one of them. And the reality right. is the very first person I called, V was actually the one that broke the news uh, to me through text message. And, but the very first person I called me was, too. was you. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, you know, and the reason for that obviously is because you've been a lifelong Lakers fan, right? Even before Kobe. And right. then obviously as Kobe came, you know, you were, you became also a, a lifelong Kobe Bryant fan. Champion of Kobe. Right. Yeah. And, right. you know, we've had many discussions over the years about, you know, Kobe versus Jordan, Kobe versus LeBron, all that type of stuff. And so it right. just it 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 hit me um, that it probably hit you at, mm-hmm. at, at, at least as as badly as it hit me, you know. And so I was like, <laughs> let me talk to Will. So, you know, obviously, I'm not going to ask you what were you thinking when you heard it. Obviously, you know, it was it was a terrible thing. But I kind of yeah. wanted you to just you know, as a lifelong Lakers fan, put Kobe's career in context for us uh, historically uh, with, uh, with all basketball players. And then also yeah. as a Lakers fan, and, and why why you love him so much personally, right? And why right. why I hit you so hard, right? So, uh, yeah. First of all, man, like yeah, when I when I heard the news, uh, I was getting you know texts and group texts, a lot of group texts from different people. Uh, at the time, you called me, Mech. Uh Dimitri called me, V called me, all around like at the same time. It was it's just a crazy surreal moment surreal day 
Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, you know, at first was, you know, I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then when I, when it finally hit me, I'm like, wow. And, uh, yeah, there were tears shed that day for, for sure. sure. Uh, yeah, man. So, um, you know, and then when I heard about his daughter, man, that just, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. just, that's just, that's, that's kept the, the tears going for, for a few days. Mm-hmm. So, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, man, Kobe, I mean, look, right. You, we've been having conversations for years about Kobe and his place in the, in the top 10, mm-hmm. his place in the goat conversation, uh, all that stuff. I mean, that, I mean, that literally right we me, would go back yeah. and forth for emails for days and days looking up stats yeah. c- c- comparing you'd be like Kobe this is why Kobe is better than Jordan we'd come yeah. back Jordan is better this is why Kobe will never do this like for weeks and weeks and weeks I went back and I looked at some of those emails so it was <laughs> a huge part of our lives and I remember you know both yeah. of us we talked about it pretty much every time we talked yeah 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 man it was it was it was a constant thing and that's that's one of the things that really hit me too when I saw I uh, you know I turned on the TV and you see Kobe Bryant, 1978 uh, to 2020, mm-hmm. and you and you know I, I'm like I'm like man, how many times <laughs> when we're debating have I googled Kobe and gone to his Wikipedia page? And you know now when I Google him, I'm gonna go to his Wikipedia page and it's going to say died, mm-hmm. you know, January 2020. That that right there is just you know it just really made it like I, I can't believe this, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. crazy. So, um, uh, man, so so anyway. Um, yeah, man. Like you know, all that goat conversation talk uh, is just not important, yeah. you know, right now anymore. And and that's the thing, you know. And, and that's what his his death has kind of made me start to think about a little bit with Kobe. It's just like why, and like you said, B. Why do why did I like him so much? Why did I love Kobe so much? And like you know, part of it is is that he kind of got to the point where like he's he said to himself, he's like, look, I gave my all to basketball. I tried my hardest at what it was I was doing. I gave it all. I felt, you know, an objective. He he tried to catch Jordan in all the object objective measures, uh, championships, things of that nature. He wasn't trying to control anybody's opinion of him, mm-hmm. yeah. and that's what and that's the key thing that you know this has kind of brought to to light here. And that's the key thing that I respect about Kobe. It's like he wasn't trying to control your opinion. He didn't care about what you thought. Mm-hmm. And that's what and that's what you saw after he retired. And he just he's like, look, yeah, I won five championships. I didn't I I didn't pass Jordan. I didn't pass Jordan. I don't care. You say you know all these people are saying LeBron is better. He's like, I don't really care, mm-hmm. and I believe him. He doesn't really care because you know what? At, at that point, you know, it's everybody's opinion. You yeah. know, he he put it all out there. He tried his best, uh, and and that's what's so inspirational about Kobe, man. Like he could he could retire in peace. Uh, because you know he put it all out there on the floor, man. He gave his best, and that's and that's all you can do, man. Just be be the best you. That's a quote that I've been seeing going around the past few days. It's just like kind of be the best version of yourself, and that's what that's what Kobe was, man. And so. and, and you know that the Mecca and I and a lot of Jordan fans, hardcore Jordan fans, early in Kobe's career, we were young too, right, and immature. Mm-hmm. We were yeah. like we hated the fact that Kobe was trying to be like Mike, like. We're like, he walks like him. He talks like him. He chews his gum like him. (laughs) Like, who is this dude? Like, but I honestly feel like we've been blessed. Our era of people who are teenagers in that, in that era when Kobe came in, we've been blessed with the Jordan era, the Kobe era and the LeBron era. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I hate to say this about his death, but I felt like everyone was talking LeBron Jordan and Kobe was almost my list still is Jordan, Kobe, LeBron. Now, as I right. matured, I, I grew an appreciation. Like, Kobe saw this is the greatest basketball player of all time. Who else would I study? And mm-hmm. I'm going to do every single thing he did because there's never been anyone that dominant. If you listen to mm-hmm. listen to D-Wade the other yeah. night when he was uh, speaking about Kobe and he said that he had spoken to LeBron – beforehand and asked LeBron basically what what would you want me to say uh if you know if I'm going to be speaking kind of to the country about this and LeBron essentially said and D-Wade agreed was that everyone thought that there was like some battle between them and rivalry yeah. and you know there right. is naturally right because they're competitors but right. it was way overblown it was more mm-hmm. of a thing that was controlled and, and and instigated by the fans than it was between them yeah. he said that they just wanted they knew Kobe was the leader of this generation in basketball mm-hmm. And they just mm-hmm. wanted Kobe 
to be proud of them. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, you know, yeah. to have guys that are as great historically as mm -hmm. LeBron James and as D Wade look to a guy who they're currently playing against, not a guy that's, you know, 30 years older than them, a guy who they're currently yeah. playing against and feeling like, wow, I just want this guy to be proud of me. That yeah. speaks a lot yeah. to his impact. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you again, more specifically is mm -hmm. as a Lakers fan, yeah. Why did Kobe mean so much to you guys? Because you guys have had so much success. You got even the Showtime so many Lakers, legends. so many late, right. so many legends. But it seems like Kobe hit different. When you talk to yeah. people about Kobe, he just hit them different. He hits them different than Magic did. He hits them different than Kareem did. T tell us right. why that is in your mind. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's a there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, number one is that uh, a lot of people doubted Kobe. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear I hear I'm hearing stories now. You know, and I've heard so many stories before, similar stories like this before, when Kobe was in high school uh, and nobody knew who he was. He was the number 13 goes, pick. <laughs> number 13. Right, yes, and number, we know what that means right. in the NBA. Like, if right. you're outside the top 10, you're not. You're not <laughs> supposed to be what Kobe became. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, yeah, so when he was, when Kobe was in high school, man, like, you know, he had to prove himself. Uh he had to prove himself to guys like Tim Thomas, mm -hmm. right? Tim yep. Thomas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and 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 that's what's so funny about it. He'd go to, you know, there's a story about him going to a camp, and Tim Thomas and and Vince Carter and some other guys were there, and Kobe came in the room, and you know, they're just like, "Who's this guy?" And Kobe's <laughs> like, "Yeah, I'm 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 the best player in the country," mm -hmm. and then they all start laughing at him. Yeah. And, he, and then he came out and in the scrimmage that next day or something and, and dropped 50, 50 points in the mm. scrimmage. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so that's what, you know, that's what Kobe is, man. He's like a, he's like a, he's a superstar, but he was also an underdog kind of figure. Mm. Like he was, he was always being doubted and he'd come out victorious so many times. It's just like, how can you, how can, if you're a fan of the Lakers, how can you not love this guy? If you're a fan of bad sports, how can you not appreciate this guy? And that's just, that's just what, you know, that's just what it was, man. Like he, he was, he was an underdog story oftentimes. I mean, just, just different things he was battling, uh, different people doubting him, people calling him overrated. Uh, and I don't even understand His what that was His own coach saying from. he was a problem, right? With Phil Jackson. <laughs> yes, everybody, Writing. everybody's coming. Everybody's saying, oh, he grew up in Italy. He's not like us. We don't like him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and just all these different things that he had to overcome. And he just, he just, you know, said, F it. You know, look, I'm going to go out there and ball. Yeah. I'm going to hoop on you guys. And he went out there and hooped on everybody, man. That's so, that's, that's just so inspirational. And, you know, it's just something that I think that, that us Lakers fans kind of attached ourselves to, and we looked at him like he was some type of, you know, like, a, like a hero. And yeah. like, he's, he almost seemed invincible, man. That's why this whole thing was, you know, this whole thing about him, him dying here is just, it, it, it was shocking and unbelievable for so long. And then to know that he left with his daughter and, and to, to, you know, to try to imagine what he was probably thinking in that moment that he, you know, realized that this was it. Uh, you know, when he couldn't protect his daughter, man, that right there just, you know, that yeah. right there just hits real hard. I feel it's like there's been, I feel like there's kind of been a generational shift, right, in terms of even yeah. a culture where people kind of look at somebody who's that competitive mm -hmm. in a negative light, right? Oftentimes, right. like, like what's wrong with him, you know? And yeah. and the thing about it was, it was like he never wanted anyone else from to keep anyone else from reaching their dreams. He just wanted to be better and the best. And that meant that he had to be better than LeBron James. That meant that he had to mm -hmm. be better than Michael Jordan. Not in a sense that, yo, you know, it was, it was what drives excellence. If you don't have peers that motivate you and drive you to be better or ghosts right. that you're chasing, how are you supposed to be great at something? And I feel like for a long period of time in Kobe's career it was like, he's been dogged by the fact that, he was actually trying to be better than Jordan. People didn't want him to do that. The other thing, too, Will, that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier in the show was just about how we watched Kobe, partially because he was so young, right, when he got to the league, but also we knew a little bit about him in high school. We watched him right. grow up, you know, like yep. literally not. We watched him become a man, not take out basketball for a second, but we watched, yep. you know, trials and tribulations, you know, beats with teammates, professional issues, personal issues, issues with his family, you know, and we watched him come out of all of that and mm -hmm. become this guy, this figure that, 
is, is very, yeah. very powerful, right? And and right. inspirational. And if you listen just on social media, how many people mm-hmm. have stories about Kobe? Like people that <laughs> like personal time that he took away to talk to people or give people nuggets of information. And then one other yeah. thing too <clears throat> that I think is yeah. important that I mentioned as a black man, yeah. you're not thousands and thousands and thousands of guys that you can look up to right in the public eye that are that are inspirational that have you know overcome a lot that people admire that have created such a a a great legacy and Mm that's another reason why i think for me personally it hit Mm -hmm. me also really hard because he's one of the you know if you mention how many you know you're going to mention him, you're going to mention Magic, you, you know, mm-hmm. you Barack, whoever. Mm-hmm. They're 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 not tons yeah. of them, you know. And so right. when you lose someone like that, it's like wow. Yeah, it just it yeah. Just... He was he was one of the good ones, man. He was one of the good ones, and and that's the and that's what I think he ended up. I I, I think he kind of, you know, he was. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, uh, you know, our boy Rob, mm-hmm. and uh, I was talking to him yesterday, and I I told you know I said, look, you know, Kobe was very guarded uh his you know the first part of his career he's very guarded because he was defensive he he lived like kind of he, he had this defensive persona uh you know i think he thought that everybody you know he thought that a lot of people were against him and a lot of people were right all right and i think i think what happened was i think as he got older and he started seeing you know you know all these guys all these you know nba players coming to him looking up to him mm-hmm. telling him that they looked up to him and all these other, uh, you know, figures. I mean, look, Saquon Barkley, man. You remember last year, Saquon Barkley wrote a wrote a poem. Yeah, Kobe. Yeah, <laughs> to Kobe. Yep. Like, you know, a, a crossed poem. Crossed all sports. Uh, yeah. Yes, he crossed all sports, and I think that Kobe started letting his guard down. And he's like, man, people actually love me. They actually like me. And like, then you started seeing who Kobe really was. Yeah. Uh, I think as a person, and he started letting himself go. He wants to like. He wants to go out there and teach people. He wants. He wants these people to love him. Right. He wanted, he's always wanted that, yeah. you know, and he just never felt like he was getting it. And I think he was, he was a little, he was a little over, overly defensive, uh, at least the first, first part of his career, man. But we, we definitely lost a, a good one. I think somebody, I saw somebody uh, post something on social media uh, saying, you know, I, you know, <laughs> look how we're acting about Kobe. I mean, I, I, I can only imagine, you know, how, how it was for our parents when they lost Martin Luther King, right. because like they just literally nobody has seen any reaction to a to a figure to a, a celebrity uh, like we've seen uh, the reaction to Kobe. Man. Yeah, he's, Glo- he's globally too. Yes, yeah, globally. And globally. so I, I guess I'll get you out of here on this. I guess um, yeah. you know, as a Lakers fan and as a fan of Kobe, you know, what, what would be you know if you wanted people to kind of take something from his life, you know, yeah. or what, or maybe even what you've taken from his life, just just tell us that real quick and let's. Uh, Let's you know try to get out of here on a positive note. Yeah, I mean, look, Kobe. Kobe was a resilient uh, warrior. Uh, he, you know, the story of his career is like, look, this man came into the league with one goal in mind, and that was to be the greatest player of all time. And he said he was he was aiming to win seven, eight, nine championships. Mm-hmm. He didn't. He he fell short. He fell short of his goal, and then he ended up he he ended up being okay. You know, everybody thought like, "Oh, Kobe's going to be a wreck when he retires." No. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't. Right. This man went off and he 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 went on to, you know, start living a very meaningful life and, you know, then he changed his focus uh to become, you know, the greatest father mm-hmm. he could be. Mm-hmm. Uh and 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 you know, that's just one thing. Whatever you whatever you're doing, just be great at it. Yeah. And that's what that's what from- Kobe I think embodied. And learning from your mistakes, right? He was imperfect yes. in many yes. ways, but he grew from every, it seemed like he grew from every mistake that yeah. he made. And if all of us kind of lived in the public light and, and we were seen at our worst moments, who knows how people would judge judge every person in this world. Absolutely. And I think, you yeah. know, like for all of us, you know, here, obviously you and everyone we know, we're going to continue, try to continue his legacy, continue living that Mamba mentality and um, obviously, like I, I've you said multiple times. It's a times, real thing, right? This mama mentality, it's a real, real thing. It's defined. Yes. If, if, when people say, <laughs> you know what you know what it means, right? Mm-hmm. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's giving your best at whatever you do and not, and, and, and not holding back, man. Right. Not holding it, back. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. prayers, obviously prayers to his, his wife and the rest of his family, prayers to the families of the other people that were also on the helicopter. And Absolutely. like I said, we'll continue living, living on and, and trying to, 
live up to his legacy. Thanks for joining us on the Pilot Boys podcast, Will. All right, man. All right. Thank you. All right. Take okay. care. All right, guys. Bye. There it is. That is as good as it gets right there. One of the NBA's all-time greats. And the Black Mama strikes again. <laughs> Mama mentality is it's a it's a way of life. It's not an attitude per se, but it's a way to live, which is just trying to get better every single day. It's not something where you you know you live with like a bravado or anything like that. It's just it's just the simplest form of just trying to get better at whatever it is that you're doing. Yes, he's on fire, the mama. You're listening to the Pilot Boys podcast. We are here with our college football resident insider, Coach Zach Smith. What's going on, man? Welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having mm-hmm. me. Yeah, so we, you know, obviously this has been a very heavy show for us. You know, there have been some good moments and some funny moments. But, you know, for the most part, this week has been very tough for for us, um, reacting kind of to this Kobe Bryant news. And, you know, I saw on social media, you know, you've also taken it pretty hard, right, as well, because you're also a father. And so I just wanted to kind of just, you know, get a little bit of your your thoughts on on the situation and, and kind of what you take from it moving forward. Yeah, see, I mean, Kobe the athlete is obviously a very different uh persona than than Kobe off the court mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I think uh so uh, there's it's, it's such a deep conversation wow, right super deep. I mean you could talk about the the iconic athlete that we lost that's just a deep conversation mm-hmm. what he meant uh that really transcended being a basketball player uh how he his crossover to all sports mm-hmm. and then to human beings in general then to business I mean just so many things about the whole Mamba mentality I right. think is just a deep conversation that's really sports oriented but where, where it hit me the hardest um, and why I related so well to it. I used him all the time in motivating my players and giving an example. And I think Michael Thomas was the, the greatest embodiment that I coached of that Mamba mentality. Yeah, right? he's they, Mamba mentality all yeah. day. And um, I think the, the, the part that hit me the hardest was definitely him being uh, you know, a father of, of girls mm-hmm. and just the, the conversation about, about how he was going to impact female sports and the role he was playing in his daughter's lives because I have two daughters. Mm-hmm. And so that just, I mean, that's when I, I, I was upset initially. Yeah. But then when we start talking about the stuff he was doing for his girls and just the passion he had for being a, a father of girls, it just it, it just destroyed me. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and one thing I want to talk about, you said that the relatability here is interesting, right, is Kobe's a basketball player. LeBron James is a basketball player. But as a coach of football, you realize with a lot of the kids that come in, the people they look up to aren't football players. They are these guys, LeBron, Kobe. That's who how how's that happen when you're a football player or a football coach and a basketball player is your greatest motivator? We've seen people in every sport, Neymar in soccer, CEOs of Apple across all walks Bill of Bill Belichick. Relate yeah. relate to a basketball player. Bill Belichick, <laughs> Bill Belichick said, you know, on these point that Kobe was the, the the time he saw his team the most captivated by a speaker was when they brought Kobe Bryant in to speak. So absolutely, I, and I think I think what you look for when you're let's say you're coaching uh, those guys that are great, mm-hmm. not not because Kobe Bryant transcended greatness. It wasn't mm-hmm. he was just great. He was elite. He was mm-hmm. that that one percent of one percent. Right. Yeah. And so when you're coaching Somebody. guys that are, let's say, going to be NFL football players. OK, there's there's a lot of those. Mm-hmm. In, yeah. Just in numbers. Right. right? Uh, not related to population. But so, OK, what what is going to make them different? And so that's what you're always looking for is who has uh, has captivated the audience of your players. Mm-hmm. Like who do the, already has their attention mm-hmm. and who do you want to kind of drive them towards to achieve that that next level, to to maximize them, and, and there's very few uh, in my career. Tom Brady's one, LeBron James is one, Kobe Bryant's one, and Tiger Woods. Mm-hmm. And there's probably other ones, but those yeah. are the four that I just studied what they did off the court, how they approach the game, like because it's so easy to be a first round draft pick, make ten million dollars, and be very very satisfied. Right. And yeah. so you're trying to take a kid that's gonna have that and say, how can I motivate him to get a hundred million dollars? Mm-hmm. How can I motivate him to make an impact off the court? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And and the things that Tom Brady, LeBron, Kobe, though, and Tiger Woods, what they did, like taking care of their body, how they approach the game, how hard they worked, even though they were one of the best players. Right. Like, that's what you're trying to encompass and bring to the table, and Kobe did it. Yeah, and speaking yeah. of, you know, there's no good transition out of the Kobe talk, but you did mention the elite players, and one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about was the Bosa's, right? Because I yeah. know you were there at Ohio yeah. State um, with both of them, and one of the things that is so, well, first of all, 
how much of this is just genetics, right? Because, I mean, I think their dad played in the, in the pros. Their uncle played. Their, their uncle was an, a first-rounder. Their dad was a first-rounder. They got yeah, genetics. Yeah, they, right. They right. got some good DNA. Yeah. And, and how much of it is, is you know, developmental? Because, you know, first of all, I remember talking to Chris Carter. This was, this was before Nick had even come to Ohio State. I think Nick was a, either a sophomore or a junior in high school. And Chris was and, an assistant coach for that team, right? Yeah, the wide receivers Florida. coach. And he told me, he said, look, man, he said, Joey obviously is amazing generational talent. He's like, but his brother is better. Yeah, he's that's... like, you're not going to believe me until you see it. And I was like, well, how? How? Is that possible? Yeah, so, no one believed him. I recruited the school. And yeah. I didn't know. Everyone was like, all right. But because especially being in the, that side and recruiting, you hear that shit all the time. Yeah. yeah. Like you go to California, you're like, I'm telling you, man, I saw little Mikey when he was a receiver. <laughs> and, uh, and this kid's better. And you're right. like, I, I fucking get it. Right. Everyone is the better version of the star that yeah. came from your city. Right. right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you hear it so much that you're like, all right, I hear this every fucking day. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, he he, he was. Do you think do you so you do think he's better? I mean, it's, uh, it's such a like it's so hard when you're dealing with that level of, of elite. Right? He also has the benefit of having like just like Kobe had Michael Jordan, he also had his big brother, his yeah. dad. Like he's like it always seems like the youngest has the most value to gain from everyone else in addition to their talent. Right? Yeah, that's why and he he has a great point and it's a lot like basketball players with Kobe like the, there's a blueprint now. Yeah. Right? There's a blueprint that you can try to follow or try to chase like Kobe did Mike and and like Nick did Joey. Mm. You have this path to follow and and Joey laid the the foundation and then Nick just comes in and he's got this foundation of Larry Johnson's teachings, his technique, how Joey approached it and so I don't know who's better. They're they're a little bit different in right. how they play the game. Nick is a little bit quicker and and kind of has a slightly better burst. I mean you're yeah. I mean you're comparing like Splitting a hairs. a Ferrari and a Lambo here, right. like right. Yeah. but uh, and Joey's a little bigger, a little taller, yeah, maybe slightly more powerful. So I mean they're a little bit different, but I mean they're. Well, I don't want to. What, what do you what what do you th- like? And that's what do you think the greatest development each probably had at Ohio State, like. In terms of the influence of Larry Johnson, like what he teaches, like if you look across the NFL, it's not just these two guys, right? No, it's, it's, there's there's something different about the way he develops defensive line prospects that actually elevates and translates to the NFL. Could you kind of put? Yeah, Larry. I mean, he he uh, was very, I guess, influential on how I approached developing receivers after I watched him develop D linemen because he, he every off season. You'd, I would go on and everything's filmed and I could go on and just watch his tapes and it was different drills every year. It's not like he had these go-to drills that he did. Now, he had some fundamental things, but he constantly was trying to find a new way to put a D lineman in a game-like situation and de- develop and refine that skill. Mm-hmm. So you'd see a clip on tape of a D lineman like maybe not winning on a pass rush and he would pause it and sit there and say, all right, how can I create a, a, a refined drill to work that scenario in the off season. So when that scenario comes up again, he's ready for it. Mm. So he just, he's next level. He was always thinking outside the box. He wasn't taking drill tapes from other coaches. He was just creating what he thought was a way to develop a D lineman. Right. It's very different thinking. And that's one thing I don't want to trivialize. When I mentioned genetics, I don't want to trivialize um, their work ethic, right? Because a lot of people have good genetics. And, you know, we talk about this even with kind of in the Kobe discussion of being the best version of, of themselves, of yourself, and it seems as though both of those brothers took that very seriously. Because, very focused. Yeah, it doesn't matter how what genetics you have. If you don't buy into that kind of level of thinking, you can't get to that level the of greatness. The psychological aspect of greatness is much harder than the physical, right? No doubt. And, and, and it, it, what told the tale for me was Joey was here at Ohio State. It was in his last year, so his junior year. And I'm recruiting St. Thomas Aquinas. I didn't really recruit Nick. I mean... I, yeah. I was there. I would see him when I went there. So I like kind of helped recruit him. But really, that was Larry Johnson was recruiting him in Urban Meyer, you know? Right. Yeah. And um, so I, I grabbed Joey one day just walking down the hall, and I said, what's the deal with your brother? Because his brother didn't commit forever. Right. And it's yeah. like everyone down there, everyone I know, all my like little pe- my peoples, yeah. right? They're all telling me, like, what are you talking about? He won't even talk to other schools. Right. He's coming to Ohio yeah. State. And I'm like, why won't the motherfucker commit that? <laughs> right. Because like, right. right. w- I'm, I'm getting phone calls when I leave the school. Like, what did they say? What's he, is, is he coming? Is right. Alabama in there? You know. Right. Right. So I asked Joey, I said, what's the deal? Like, is, what's he thinking? He was like, why, are, why is everyone so worried? I was like, I don't know. He hasn't committed yet. He was like, bro, he's not going to play for anyone but Larry Johnson. Right. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. Like, <laughs> do you right. think he's going to go play for another D-line coach? Right. And I was right. like, gotcha. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Wow. So Larry Larry is that special. And I remember when, when Larry got hired, when he, they 
basically came from Penn State. He came from Penn State, right? Oh, yeah. And I remember how big of a, a hire that was. And, oh, yeah. you know, I think obviously now he he his resume is just speaks for itself. I mean, yeah. obviously the Bosa brothers. The Rushman. The yeah, Rushman. The Rushman. That's a, it's, it's a real brand. And so I guess speaking about the Bosa's, obviously uh, Nick is playing in the Super Bowl this weekend. Do you have any predictions on that game? How do you think that game is going to play out? It's, I mean, it's it's going to be probably the best Super Bowl in the last, you know, yeah. five five years, ten years. I yeah. mean, just as far as matchup, yep. you're talking about a tough-ass defense, a, a, a run game, kind of old-school football versus the, the the light show that is right. uh, Patrick Mahomes right. and, and, you know, the cheetah and, yeah. and all these freaks. Right, yeah. Um, it's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't know how you can pick against Mahomes and what he's done. And what I've been telling everyone is you can stop the Chiefs, like shut them down completely for three quarters, right. and they'll still score 40. Yeah. yeah. If right. you give them one quarter where you're kind of not smothering them, they're going to score a million points. <coughs> and it, it's just, it's so it's tough to pick against them. Seems, but you got to make a pick. You got to make a pick. I'm, I'm picking Kansas City. Okay. I don't know by what, because this is the best defense in the NFL going against the best offense. You know, it's a, it's a storybook yeah. Super Bowl well, you want. Historically, historically in these games, like the Ravens, the defensive team, or the Giants with the D-line, they beat the other team that's, no doubt. you know, that's got the, the superstar offense, right? Yeah, I mean the thing is also if you look at Vegas, it's a, it's essentially a pick'em game. I think yeah. Kansas City might be given one point. The spread is one point or something like that. It's essentially a pick'em. I think a lot of people don't really know what this, what's going to happen. I think these this is the type of game where I think a few bounces here, a few bounces there could de- determine the game because I think they are evenly matched in terms of talent, even offensively. And we mentioned this last week. Can, uh, San Francisco has the studs on offense. Oh, you yeah. know, like Emmanuel Sanders is a stud. Debo Samuel, we forgot George Kittle last Ricky, week. Ricky yeah. Moster. Moster. And Garoppolo's coming into his bad. own. They're not like this team that just has like, you know, they're just all defense. They actually have some yeah. offensive studs. I think the key to winning this game for them, obviously, is controlling the clock and running the ball. Yeah. Keeping the ball out of Mahomes' hands. I know that sounds cliche, but they can actually do it. And they have, you know, three or four guys back there that run four or three and they're running back. Running that, back that actually might be the problem in this game, right? Most of breaks out for a 60-yard TD. Yeah. You, give, you give the ball back to Mahomes <laughs> right. too quickly, yeah, right? It's, it's, yeah. it, it's going to be like any other great NFL game. It's going to come down to the wire. It's going to be a two-minute drill. And it's yeah. hard to bet against the most prolific quarterback in the NFL this year throwing the ball, Patrick Mahomes, yeah. in that scenario. So, and, I, I, and you guys have to agree, like, if you're not a diehard 49ers fan – and you know football, and you know Andy Reid. You've got to be rooting for the Chiefs, and for like he deserves it for everything he's given to the game. So right? who's your who's your pick, B? It's the Chiefs, yeah. and 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 I see the arguments the other way, but yeah. I just think it's 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 this is Michael Jordan. I feel like Patrick Mahomes. We're seeing Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, whatever it takes. Like it's not just that they have a great offense, but this guy is a maniac. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's yeah. a maniac. I, and- I agree. I, I my pick is the Chiefs. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if the 49ers won, right? No. But I, but I am no. picking the Chiefs. One la- one thing I want to transition to real quick too, Zach, before we get you out of here. Obviously, Ohio State football 2020. It's the off season. It's the drudgery. It's January, you know, it's whatever. But you know, before you know it, all of a sudden there's spring ball and then there's excitement again. And then here you go. And then, you know, you're into the summer and you're kind of like Oh man, and then boom, August hits, and you're like, "Oh my god, we're, we have a game in three weeks." You know, oh, yeah. So first, first question I'll ask is like the off season, right? Like now, now until spring ball, just talk to us about what does that look like in terms of preparation, in terms of yeah. what does the look like for from from the player standpoint and from the coach's standpoint to get to get guys ready for spring ball. Well, it really starts after this signing day that is kind of a second signing day. Right. And that's when, I mean, not that it, it hasn't started already in the weight rooms. It, it, the winter is all about strength and conditioning, getting stronger, getting faster. It's really Mickey Marotti's show. Yeah. I remember just real quick, spring or winter conditioning was 6 a.m. We had 6 a.m. workouts every day, mm-hmm. five days a week for like like two or three weeks. It was the worst shit I ever been through in my life. Yeah, oh my God. I, I mean, can't imagine what it's like now. It's, 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 <clears throat> It's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. And that's when you have the two famous workouts that everyone talks about at Ohio State that Mickey Marotti puts on. The Valentine's Day, uh, whatever they politically correct call it now, celebration. It was always called the Valentine's Day Massacre. Mm. It's a two-hour long circuit training workout on a Friday, and it's like the hardest thing you've ever ex- w- witnessed in mm, your life. Okay. I've never experienced it, thank yeah. God. <laughs> but I watched a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then there's a the Harley-Davidson one, which is right before spring ball starts, and those are kind of the toughness-building workouts. But it's going to be absolute 
I mean, just grinding. Yeah. And then there's going to be a lot of skill development stuff after signing day when these coaches come back. Like the Mad Hatter, Kerry Combs, is going to have a, a young secondary to, to mold right. and, and develop and teach and coach. Yeah. That, and that's a question that I have, right? When you lose a bunch of seniors or early draftees or early NFL entrants, how that competition works? Because now there's an open slot, right? Like I could be a starter next year kind of take us into that competition then how you evaluate it as a coach on the other side to determine who's going to start opposite Sean Wade who's going to start at safety now that Jordan Fuller's gone kind of take us into that process because at some point it seems like you might be guessing as a coach right it's like I don't know like well the coolest shit the coolest shit in the world is is you just get to develop them all and then it really comes down to who's going to Take what you're trying to get accomplished, and you can see it coming. Yeah, I mean, not right now, right? But as you get into spring ball, then you go through spring ball, and you see how everyone reacts to their performances in spring ball. Going mm. through the summer, you can see it coming. Mm. Like you can always, I saw it coming from Michael Thomas at the end of his redshirt season as a sophomore. It was like finally you saw it, and you're like, this son of a bitch is going to be a monster yeah. next fall. Yeah. Yeah. But no one knew that. Right. But I, I could see it coming. Right. And so you could see it happening, but it's really about who's going to seize the opportunity. Right. I and, mean, and they see it. Like you said, it's it, it's like a – and at that position, you're, yeah. ta- you're talking about a bag of $10 million just sitting on the table. It's like, yeah. who who wants it? Right. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. And and specifically the receivers, right? It's like – Oh. It seems like this is like what we had at quarterback. Like, who the, who the fuck is going to start? Like, yeah. it's like there's so many freshmen. You have Marvin Harrison's son coming in. It's like, I don't, have we ever had like – Combined with the guys that you recruited and the guys that, you know, um, that are being recruited now, have we ever had this type of depth of talent receiver? And how do you make those decisions? Well, it's a lot of unproven depth outside of Chris Olave. And and, and I, you can't even say Garrett Wilson yet, though he is a, a great talent. He hasn't proven anything. I yeah. mean, he's made he made a catch or two uh, uh, in big games. But I think those are the two names everyone's going to talk about. Uh, uh, and then it's going to be about who who else is ready to play at that level. Mm-hmm. And they're going to they don't play two or three i mean there's six, six guys, at yeah. least yeah. Uh-huh. and so who are those six going to be and and the guys like jameson williams who's who could be a national name next fall mm-hmm. if he trains hard and develops his body and matures this offseason so that's right. why it's so critical right like and for people that sit here and talk about projections for next year it's like yeah. you have no idea what those kids are gonna do yeah for yeah. the next eight months right yeah. like they could go through some shit off the field family issues something like that not train that hard and not not develop and another kid might just yeah, explode. Well, yeah. you know it's funny. I'm actually going to make you do what you just don't want. To, what you just said you don't want to do, <laughs> which is I'm Con- conveniently, yeah, conven- mm-hmm. right. Just right on time is I do want to know. You know, and again, obviously, this is not. We're not. I'm not asking to whip out the crystal ball, but there are names I think of players and uh, at Ohio State that we don't necessarily know now. Or that the, the country doesn't know now yes. that they're going to know by this time next year. The guys that get lost in the mix aren't the new recruits, right? The guys that are coming in as freshmen. It's the the guys who are five, four stars last year that everyone was saying the same thing about the guys. Oh yeah, that are coming in this. Well, that's year. always what it is. The minute a kid leaves, it's like the five star that everyone's been talking about in recruiting is going to start. Right. You're like, well, yeah. there's three classes in between you forgot <laughs> yeah, about. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest names that people don't. I mean. Diehard Buckeye fans will know them probably. But I think the most important players that that will show up next fall, if I was to do what I just said I don't want to do, <laughs> yeah, exactly. appreciate it, is um, I think Josh Proctor is going to be a national household name next year. He's so happy to hear that. I, he, he's, he's an absolute safety. freak he's show. He was a freak show in high school. Everything I heard about from people in the program was this past year was that he was an absolute freak show. Mm. He had that Malik Hooker ability where – when there was a scrimmage, somehow that son of a bitch ha- had a pick. Like yeah. it, every every day. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Austin Mack was talking about that when he was in here. And then the other, the other guy I'm most excited for because he's my guy. I stood on the table to bring him to Ohio State. St. Louis native Cameron Brown, mm, um, who yeah. who played a little bit in like in Okuda's absence when he got tweaked and dinged and Arnett's absence. He was that kind of fourth corner mm. that I think really has a chance with Kerry Combs coaching him. He's a great kid. Will do anything you ask. That's a kid that I see stepping it up at corner. Wow. And then on the offensive side of the ball, I think the real question mark. I hate to be the De- Debbie Downer. I I think Master Teague is a really good back. I don't think he is a national top five running back mm-hmm. i just don't think he is right so i don't know who that is yeah it seems like the the program is big on crowley yeah a lot of people have talked about him i haven't seen anything he got from hurt him. right 
Yeah, and I haven't seen anything from him that would tell me that he's going to be big time. Right. Again, that's the luxury of the offseason is he could have a ridiculous offseason and be one of the top backs in the country. Yeah. And then the receiver position is going to be loaded. They're just going to be young. I yeah. mean, Chris Olave should have one of those All-American type of years. Uh, Garrett Wilson should should definitely improve on a good, decent, fresh, a good freshman season. Yeah. And um, the guy that's forgotten about and I'm really – I'm rooting for is Cameron Babb, who's had – multiple knee injuries hasn't hasn't been healthy since he's been at Ohio State but he was one of the best high school receivers in the country mm. so if he can find a way to stay healthy and get and they can get those knees solid right he, he could be a kid that next fall people are like holy shit look at him he's healthy like, yeah and now he's a popular name you know last question I'll ask is what are we going to see from Chris Olave next year with what happened in the Clemson game how the kid is feeling oh I think he's he's it was the the greatest thing that could ever happen to him, even though he probably disagrees right now because he's a chip on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And for that, yeah. when the stuff like that happens in your last game of the year, mm -hmm. you have like eight months to think about. That's how you ended the season, yeah. your season, right? And the the impact on the team and the blah 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 blah. And right. all of a sudden, you have eight months to just be pissed off. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that he was gonna have a great year next year without that. Right. And now it's only gonna enhance and in, in his mindset. This offseason. Yeah. I look forward to that. Obviously, we all look forward to it. And the funny thing, like I said, it seems like we're in the drudgery of like the offseason, but you know, things start rolling. Combine comes, Super Bowl, then Combine. The next thing you know, you're in spring ball. And then, you know, the next thing you know, the season rolls around. So obviously, we'll be talking about this with you a lot more. Thanks for joining us on the Pilot Boys podcast. Make sure you guys check out Zach Smith on Twitter and Instagram at Coach Zach Smith and listen to his podcast, Menace to Sports. It's available everywhere. That's all we have for today's show. Big thanks to our guests, Jeff Bowles, Will Guilford, and Zach Smith. Thanks to everybody for listening. Don't forget, sharing is caring. Subscribe to the Pilot Boys podcast on Apple, Spotify, Patreon, and YouTube. And please follow us on social media at Pilot Boys Pod on Twitter and at Pilot Boys Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And follow the hosts on Twitter. I am at Mechadon Music, and V is at Viswant. And like Kobe Bryant, be you, you was fly. Pilot Boys out! Where the Pilot Boys at? Pilot Boys, we get on up!